Good evening, everyone. It's seven o'clock. I'd like to call you to order. Please be advised to join me in the place of the night. speak with you all here tonight. Um, Cindy and I work pretty closely throughout the year, so you know, we know each other pretty well, but it's been a little bit, I think, before uh, since I've been invited to speak for the board, so I really do welcome the opportunity here. Um, and because it's been a little bit, I thought that it might uh, make sense to kind of start out 
um, with the presentation on just giving an overview of what it is that we at Municipal Solutions do for the district here. Okay. Um, so we've actually had a long history uh, with the district as financial advisors. Um, I started with the company in 2008, kind of the ground running, um, right off the bat working with Akron. But um, Jeff Smith, who's the owner of our company, he started the firm in 2006. And prior to that, he was with another financial advisory firm um, and brought Akron right along with him uh, when he, he ventured out on his own. So I think all in all, we've probably been working with Akron for uh, two decades, if not longer. Um, so a long history here, obviously. And um, it, and what we do in that capacity is a number of different things, but primarily we are mostly involved with um, capital project financing um, and the state aid planning that goes along with that, as well as obtaining the financing for any other capital needs that there may be, primarily with the cost borrowing, so we'll help you with those as well. So as part of the overall capital project planning, Kind of where we are today is we're headed towards possibly and the next potential vote at some point. Um, we start pre-referendum services with really sitting down um, with the district's team, seeing what um, the capital project goals are, starting to project out the, um, the amortization schedules for that, putting together the various sources of financing, um, primarily through you know, your uh, capital reserve contributions, the different pots of state aid that may be available to you, and then ultimately, um, you know, how much is going to be needed to be financed uh, by the district. So starting to map all of that together, getting all of the pieces um, to the puzzle together, determining if there may be any tax, um, tax implications or not for the project. Um, so, you know, and monitoring that throughout the process. So, pre-referendum through um, the eventual wrapping the project up and going out and getting long-term bonds um, and, and finalizing you know, that project itself. So um, along with the financing piece of it, we also help with the state aid planning and reporting along the way. Um, as the project progresses, there are various milestones that require documentation to be submitted to SED um, to ensure that the um, aid is flowing um, on time and as expected. And so we really help the district with monitoring when those key deadlines are, making sure that the, the paperwork is submitted on time and accurately. So doing all of those forms for you. Um, and then going out and actually securing the financing on your behalf. So we kind of serve as middlemen between the district and the ultimate purchasers in any of your debt. So we have short-term bond anticipation notes, and then eventually long-term serial bonds. So through that issuance process, the district will need to um, prepare offering documents, laying out the terms of the issue. So we, with the assistance of Cindy and, and others in the district, will prepare the documents that we then send out to potential bidders. Most of the debt that you issue was done via a competitive sale process. So we'll set up that sale and facilitate the bids that come in, make a recommendation as to which investor we feel would be best suited uh, for the district, and then getting you through um, the closing process and getting the funds in, into your bank account. Um, in addition to going out and getting new debt for you, we also keep an eye on the opportunity to refinance any of your, your existing debt that's on the books. Um, every every payment you have, so you basically make payments on your um, bonds every six months. So as a courtesy of the district, we will send out payment reminders um, to Sue and Cindy to make sure that those payments are being made on time. But that also allows us to keep a fresh set of eyes on the debt issuances and seeing if there's the opportunity um, to, to refinance those and take, take advantage of any savings in the interest um, that we may see in the current day market. Um, and then finally, you know, once you issue bonds, there are ongoing reporting requirements that um, are set in place by the SEC. 
the Securities and Exchange Commission, because when you're issuing bonds, we actually are going out there and issuing federal securities. So there is ongoing reporting um, that we make sure you are complying with. Um, we're actually in the middle of that compliance period now. There are, um, we have to file your annual financial information as well as statements of your financial and operating picture. And um, those are due by the end of December every year. So we're working on that process now and making sure those filings are being made on time so that any investors in your debt can go out and access that and, and see that ongoing information. That's important too. So that's just kind of a little overview of what it is that we do for you. Um, wanted now to turn to a wrap up of how the current project um, is finishing up here, which I'm happy to report is finished on time and is um, under budget. So we have been working hard to put together the final cost reports, which is the last big piece of documentation that needs to go into the state for any capital project. Um, and that report is provides detail of every uh, payment made to every vendor and the purpose of each of those payments. So it's a bit of an undertaking. It requires kind of an all hands on deck uh, approach to get all of that data compiled together. Um, but we have been working over the last month or so to, to put those reports together. And we filed the cost report for the main building last week with, with the state, which was great to see. Um, so we're just waiting on them to process it. And um, basically, we, they do an audit of the cost report to make sure that everything that's in there um, is aid eligible. Um, so, which we expect it will be. Um, you know, so we've gotten those cost reports into the main building, and that means that the aid on that main project number should be starting to be paid out this fiscal year, um, which is what we were planning on, which is good to see. The bus garage final cost report we have pretty well set. We are just sitting on that because the due date for that one actually isn't until next December. So we have all of the costs compiled that have been paid out to date um, for that project, but we're just waiting to actually file it until we complete the last step in the overall process. And that's going out to secure the final bonding for the project. Um, there are costs of issuance that are associated with obtaining the bond. And we want to make sure that we're including those in the report so that the state can provide aid on those costs. So, um, you know, we've got that pretty well put together. And all in all, when we put the two projects together and all of the final costs, it does look like we're coming in about $300,000 on their budget, which was really nice to see, um, especially on a project, you know, of this scale. It, it is good to see projects come in under budget, not over. And also considering a lot of, I'm sure you're all hearing a lot of inflation issues and supply chain issues and, and you know, just trouble all around getting materials and labor and goods. So um, we're very happy that maybe we get out a little bit ahead of all of this and, and come in under budget. So yeah, the final step is to go to long-term bond. This is what we are anticipating um, the final amortization schedule will look like. Um, we won't actually sell the bonds and close on them until June of 22. Uh, the reason for that is because you are in a bond anticipation note, which is a one-year note that has a set maturity date um, that will be coming due in June. So we don't want to go out and bond too early since you already have existing debt out there. We want to wait until that comes due, and then we'll convert that to the bond. Um, so this is still an estimated schedule, um, but I feel that unless we see any major changes in the market and interest rates, I think we'll come in right around these levels. Um, I do have a slightly conservative interest rate built in because again, we won't know that rate until we actually go out and sell the bonds at that point once we hold the sale, they will we'll lock it in. But I think this should get us um, pretty, pretty well what we're gonna see here. So your total debt service payment, sorry, we just wanna go back one more. Uh, the total debt service is in yellow. The anticipated building aid, again, this is pretty well where I think we'll wind up, but subject to whatever those final bonding costs are and the state's review of the reports, um, that could still change potentially. 
But um, so we've got the debt service in yellow, we've got our offsetting revenue payments in blue on here, and then the green is our net local share. So that's the net cost to the district each year um, going forward. And a negative is actually a good number. That means you're getting more state aid in than the debt service payments that are going out. Um, so because if you guys do have a question, yeah. Uh, yeah, how can we be getting more aid than what's going on? Yep. We've already spent our share. Correct. So you had um, a large capital reserve contribution, which basically took care of the local share right at the start. Um, it gets a little complicated. Um, the building aid is a formula based aid um, that's tied to your final project costs. It's divested from how you pay for the project at all. So, so because you had that capital reserve fund contribution at the front, um, that basically covered the local share, plus it allowed you to borrow less. So you incurred less interest costs on that 2.7 million, I believe it was. Um, and the other nice thing about Akron is you receive Native American building aid. And that's a special category of aid that not every district gets, obviously, not every district educates um, you know, the Native population. But um, you get that payment up front. And so we've been able to work with Cindy to utilize that upfront state aid payment to help cover the costs of, of the project as well. So that allows you to avoid um, issuing even more of that. Um, so, so that's why we've got a nice, healthy uh, revenue generating project here going forward. <laughs> um, so when we layer the current project's impacts on with your overall debt service and state aid, this takes all of your prior capital projects into consideration. You'll see here that if we look at the net um, local share going forward after 24, 25, we're going to have a drop off there. And that's where you have a prior project falling off the books. Um, I believe that was the 2007 voter approved project. So you'll be done paying for that in 2025, um, which will be opening up capacity for you in um, your overall budget to possibly look to bring on the next project at that time. Um, the net local share is a positive, you know, in 22 forward, because some of your prior projects did have payments that exceeded the state aid coming in. So that local share has been built into your budget already. Um, and that's one of the components of the tax debt calculation as well. If you're able to add that piece of where the debt service exceeds the state aid onto the, um, the cap as, as an exclusion. So it may make sense for the district in the future, you know, as we begin those discussions for the next project, to try to time the, the, the next project's impacts to come on in that year in 2026. And we could possibly look to utilize some of the drop off and the local share from a prior project to maybe help support the next project so that, you know, the, the taxpayers aren't feeling a difference since that local share is already built into your current budget. But it gives you the opportunity to bring on you know, new projects without really having a tax, an additional tax increase for them. Um, and so that just kind of brings me to my last slide here, which is um, one for one more, just, you know, considerations for the next project. So, you know, as I mentioned, the timing of the drop off. So I think it makes sense to try to align um, the aid and the debt impacts to, to hit that, that drop off in 2026. Um, and I do think that the time is right to start those discussions now for our next project so that we could hit that, that timing. Um, these projects do take some time. So 2026, while it seems like it may be far off, it, it actually isn't as we get through, um, you know, the, 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 the project planning, getting it through to a vote and then submitting to the state and then actually getting construction and having the debt and the aid start to hit. Um, we're not that far off at all. Um, and that kind of leads also to the timing of the availability of state aid. So the state um, will aid your projects, but only to a certain level. They set what are called maximum cost allowances, 
which is basically a cap on the amount of work that they will aid over a rolling five year period. And so we really want to try to time the next project coming on when a prior project is falling off uh, of that five year calculation. So that's really kind of critical in this planning um, of, of making sure we're all aware of those cost allowances and when we've got projects that are falling off so the state will open their coffers back up and, and provide more aid um, on the next projects. Um, the other key area is the, is the scope of work involved. So not only how much work are we planning on undertaking, but um, where is that work taking place and what type of work are we talking about? Um, so things to be aware of is, um, you know, in terms of the type of work that's involved, the state will generally aid most um, capital construction work. There are a few categories where they won't provide any support on things like furniture and equipment um, are the biggest items, anything that's more of a repair type of nature. So if you're just going to go out and paint a room, you know, it's kind of a one off project, they won't aid that. So, but most of what we'd be talking about for any uh, potential project should be aid eligible. Um, where the work is taking place, you, you do need work to be involved primarily at a school facility in order for that, that building to generate aid. So your main campus, your main building here, no problem at all, they'll, they'll provide aid on that. Um, your bus garage, because that supports the transportation of students and you know, supports the students occupied space, um, that will be an aid of eligible building. Where we run into some considerations of buildings that aren't aided, that would be anything that really doesn't have a student um, occupied space. So, um, you know, if, if we're talking about a concession stand or a press box, that may not necessarily be aided by the state, but there are other ways to pay for that through, you know, a combination of those reserves that we were talking about and, and ways to fund those. So, just something to keep in mind there. Um, and to that point, you know, your capital reserve level. So those savings will help um, uh, determine the size of the project that you can undertake um, and any tax impacts or no tax impacts on um, those reserve levels. So that's all we've got. Any questions? Questions? Thank you very much. All right, sure thing. Next presenter is Mrs. Treader, who will talk about our long range plan. Thank Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the long range financial plan. And um, Pat, thank you. No, time you. Okay, um, so the last time we revisited the Long Range Financial Plan uh, was in the fall of 2019. Um, and I do an annual update to our Long Range Financial Plan. I usually present it in the fall of each year. So the fall of 2009 happened, and then guess what? The pandemic. So we sort of skipped a year. We didn't, I didn't come to you last fall because we weren't able to secure data from New York State. New York State sort of shut down its offices. They weren't providing any of the resources for the data analytics that go into the project of putting this long range plan together. Um, so um, it took a whole year for them to catch up to 2020. So what I'm presenting to you tonight is actually the long range financial plan with all the data analytics that pertain to that data of the 2020 school year. Um, so they're still one year behind, but you know, they'll, they'll catch up. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware. Um, and as we look through this, um, Again, you know, generally, how, how do we prepare this projection? And we start kind of with district goals. The board sets goals, the superintendent sets goals. And from those goals, we develop a budget and we develop this long range financial plan. And it's been two separate streams that have been connected really only with my brain at this point. And I'm thrilled because this is the year when we're going to insert the missing piece to the puzzle, which is incorporating 
the strategic plan, the strategic plan for this district that's going to like close the circle. So everything will be tied together. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am about the process, the input from stakeholders, and the way that we can build a, a more robust um, structure to this, this financial uh, picture that I'm painting for you. Um, I will say that um, the last sentence on this, on this slide is important. How do these, how do initiatives become integrated with the financial plan of the district and on what basis does the board measure results? This to me is the crux of the issue. So as we go through our, our life, our, our annual school year life, you know, we create initiatives to address specific needs, but not every initiative is meant to last forever. And um, it has always been the goal that we have some format or form or process to assess results, to determine if um, an initiative has fulfilled its intended purpose, and, and if it has, whether those resources should then be redirected to a new emerging need. So it's my hope that this strategic planning process will uh, drive those initiatives and allow us an opportunity to really assess existing initiatives and whether those resources, whether those in this, uh, original initiatives have served its intended purpose and we can redirect resources to new emerging needs because with, as we know, things are constantly evolving and we can't just keep throwing money at the same problem. At some point it's solved and we move on to the next one. Um, on the next slide, I do wanna point out that everyone has a role in this. So um, school board, the superintendent, myself, administrators and supervisors, teachers, support staff and parents. And um, I know you have your binders. Tab one gives a very detailed overview of what each of those stakeholder roles involve. Okay. So again, what drives everything uh, from the Board of Education is the financial policies that um, really uh, monitor and determine how we operate as a district. So um, again, I applaud you for keeping all of your policies up to date. I encourage you to continue to monitor them as we do, and then um, we will incorporate those policies into how we um, interact and how we produce these plans and these projections for you so that you can make good thoughtful decisions that benefit the students, the community, um, and the staff. So the next slide is a very busy slide, but I, what I wanted to just do is give you some um, highlights from the binder that I've uh, prepared for you. And I know you've got a, a few weeks to look at it. Um, so this is a slide that is uh, in your tab two, and it's um, of our general fund, which is our operating fund. That's the fund that our voters vote on every year. And this is a projection summary. So you will see that there's very broad categories on the left side and um, on the the very first two columns are the budget for 2021 and the budget for the current year that we're in 2022 and then there's projections that go out for five years um, i utilize much of the data that maggie provides for us from a debt service perspective um, i incorporate um, information from known commitments current formulas at the state level i consider things like contract settlements most services cap cap constraints our debt, bus replacement plans, Smart Schools Bond Act, um, Smart Board Replacement, grant funds that are available and how we can best utilize those um, to provide as much resource to kids as possible. So these projections will, were built with all of those considerations in mind. And again, we'll be incorporating all of that into the strategic plan that will drive um, this moving forward, okay? Um, I do want to note on um, this, oh, sorry, if you could go back one, thank you. Um, I just did want to note that um, we're very conservative when we do long range financial planning and we do not overestimate revenue. So this will tend to show in those outlier years, a net deficit or in our case, a fund balance that's declining. Okay, on this slide, uh, this is our general fund expenditure analysis. Again, broad expenditure categories on the left-hand side, the two budget years side to side, and then projection out for five years. Um, in here, you will see the debt drop-off in 2026 that I spoke about. Um, 
And I, I just wanted to note for the board, our debt service payments are actually shown in an inner fund transfer line. It's not going to show as principal and interest because the state forced us to move those debt service payments into a separate fund. So we take our resources, move it to that fund, and pay from that fund. So that, that's kind of the primary purpose of this slide. And again, your binders are quite thick with lots and lots of data. Um, I wanted to, to note in this review that um, New York State Transparency and ESSA are two huge mandates that also um, involve our long-range financial plans. And they're, they're requirements that affect how we budget and, and the planning. Um, I, I do think that it's important to know that the state is forcing us to report various different ways, similar data, various different ways. And then what they do is they kind of differentiate the data at the state level, combine all the different factors, and then they have their own sets of measurements to determine our success um, in providing services to our students. So they'll take our district-wide data, they will ask us to report it by building, by student, um, by area, by demographic. And then they will spit back to us whether or not they feel we are addressing the needs in a reasonable fashion um, to the students of our district. So um, the long range financial plan and those other reporting requirements all interact um, throughout the year. So there's a few slides on district enrollment because I do want to know um, we were not able to obtain live birth data last year. We have since been able to update that. Um, this plan does not reflect the updated, but it it falls in line now that I, two weeks ago is when I was able to secure the live birth data so that I could project out enrollment. Um, it didn't change this. And I just do want to note that we do have a declining enrollment. Um, you will see on this chart, the blue line is our free and reduced lunch percent. And the red line is our students with disabilities as a percent of total enrollment. So you can see the top bar charts going down. That's our declining enrollment. And you can see the population within that enrollment and how our um, free and reduced lunch percent is going up. And our students with disabilities is staying relatively stable. Um, on this slide, I just wanted, I thought this was interesting. Again, it is kind of an enrollment story. If you can see a bubble in 2018 and 2020, those were two years when enrollment popped back up a little bit, but every other year it's been going down. Um, so again, these will all be updated now that we've been able to secure the data to, to do the enrollment projections um, moving forward. The next slide is a, another enrollment um, story, and this is in tab six of your binder. I just wanted you to know that that line kind of tells you that our upper classes, grades 9, 10, 11, and 12, those were the higher enrollment classes. The, those folks are aging out, and we have smaller kids, a smaller enrollment per grade level coming up, which does help to reinforce the declining enrollment story. So many of our um, state aid factors are based on enrollment. And uh, for example, categorical aid is generally paid based on uh, number of students, our WADA, which is also based on number of students. Um, we are measured on our FTEs and our uh, teacher student ratios, whether we're providing appropriate services to students. Those are all measurement factors that are included in the ESSA and the transparency filings. Um, as well as other measurement factors that the data sets for us. So enrollment is a critical, <laughs> critical component of every aspect of our district, um, which is why I put such a focus on it in this presentation. Um, I did give you this slide, which is a three-year comparative by grade level, so you can see how the kids are moving through the district. Um, and that is in tab four of your binder. The next slide is our FTE staffing ratios, as I alluded to a moment ago. Um, the, these uh, chart on the left is only specific titles. It had to do with teachers, special ed teachers, and academic, academic intervention services. And the chart on the right includes all FTEs. Um, in 2013-15, you will see a blip where it just does not look like we were staffed enough. And those were at the heights of the year of the gap elimination adjustment. And we made cuts. And it was um, very difficult. We, um, we did not have enough staffing. 
And I think what you are able to see now in the outlier years, 2019, 2020, is that our staffing has fully recovered. And we look like we're very strong from a staffing perspective. That's the good news. Um, the next slide is resource ratios. Um, again, this is in tab four. And we use a, uh, just to let you know, we use a very uh, robust data analytics program to um, provide you these charts and graphs and that secures all the information from the state and the local level and combines it in a way that is comparative to, to surrounding districts. So that you guys, when you look at these charts, you can kind of see how we fall out with our surrounding districts and Gary Lombosis and, and uh, Niagara Orleans Bosis areas. Um, you can see that on this chart, I just kind of circled Akron in red. Um, we appear to be in line with um, others and we, we seem to be appropriately staffed, but I think that you would find some of this rather interesting uh, when you start to drill down into the details. So uh, moving forward, we want to utilize uh, the feedback from all of our stakeholders to identify our educational needs and goals. Um, we want to study class size and staffing needs and develop a cohesive multi-year staffing plan. We want to utilize the transparency and asset feedback from New York State regarding funding levels to, uh, by building to incorporate any necessary modifications if we have to shift resources. Um, we want to identify specific outcomes and measurements of success so that you all know when you uh, endorse a budget and the community votes for that budget, that we're only spending what we have to until that particular initiative has been completed or met or a particular goal has been satisfied and then we shift those resources where they need to go. Um, and so again, I think um, current and future initiatives will be continue to be identified by our building principals and our teacher leaders. Um, and it's my hope that the strategic planning process will incorporate all of those items um, so that we can prepare a very robust and integrated model for you, um, hopefully next fall. Uh, I review uh, reserves with you know less than three times a year. We do it at budget development time. We do it at the conclusion of the audit over the summer when we sometimes shift resources. And then I do it at this point in time when I review the long range financial plan with you. Um, what I've included in your binder is reserve funds at June 30th, 2020. However, you've already received after the audit this summer, the updated reserves for June 30th, 2021. Kind of piggyback on my, Maggie's presentation, our capital reserve currently has a balance of $5,077,000, um, which the board will determine how it best wants to spend based on um, the work to be done by the steering committees of the future project um, development teams. And with that, uh, let's see, I think uh, I just wanted to note that. Uh, we will wait to update you until we can fully integrate long-range financial plan and the strategic plan that's just starting to be developed. Um, and I'll open it up for any questions that the board might have. Good. Excellent. A couple of things. You heard um, Mr. Strutter explain what is our intent. Is, is when or Mary the strategic plan that would be a process it's not a, a light switch that we put um in december we hope a uh, second meeting in december we hope to update the board on our process for development of the strategic plan uh, that will involve the stakeholders that are today the work is already beginning um but it is it is a great deal of work it's a process of providing One of the things that we heard from both presentations was the need for stability of our fiscal resources over time. And that's why it's something like many presentations, capital project, if you liken it to your own household, if you ignore the renovations that your home may need year after year after year after year, and you don't make those consistent investments, you end up like I did as a young homeowner. I had my, I had my house for 15, 20 years, all of a sudden we wanted to sell, and holy cow, I had a lot of money I needed to bring together to repair the roof, to repair the furnace, and so on. This district, on 
under city leadership, Maggie Spice did take himself to the back corner. It was to maintain our facilities by doing consistent um, building tours and inspections and having that steady process with minimal impact sticker shock that I had to the taxpayers and just maintaining the high quality standards that our students deserve and our community expects. And just long step moment with our taxpayers. So I just want to thank the city and that for starting it doesn't happen by accident. You can see from the details of the work. Thank you for sharing the information. Next item on our agenda is the hearing of individuals and delegations. Um, the public comment session is for comment, not for question and answer. It is for community members to share their concerns or thoughts with the board. When speaking, please be sure to approach the podium, state your name, and address for the record. Please use the, use the microphone. If you are representing an organization, we ask that you identify that organization. We ask that you please maintain a respectful demeanor uh, and tone with your comments. Please direct all your comments to board members and not to other members of the audience. We are allowing each individual that has submitted a pink card to speak once and ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. We have a number of cards tonight. Please stick to period. Uh, generally, this is a 15 minute uh, process, but we will go beyond that today. Uh, we also have that you not identify individual staff members or students by name for critical comment. Direct these matters to the superintendent outside of this meeting during the school business hours. In the interest of civility and respect for different points of view, these are not broader group of speakers. The board will listen to all public comment should not be expected that the board will respond. Uh, the superintendent may respond or we will request individuals to submit their questions in writing so you may get back to them in one. Before we begin the public comment, I would like to uh, share some comments on the board's behalf. Many of these points were included in the letter that was shared uh, by the board on the website yesterday. As a board, our goal is to do what is best for the children and to support the district in providing an exceptional educational environment. This year, we also need to do everything possible to keep our kids in school. The board understands our legal authority is limited to matters of educational policy, governance, and finance. We are obligated by law and our oath to office to follow these laws and the mandates of the state of New York. Not following these laws and mandates, including the mass mandate, could result in significant financial penalties to the district. These potential penalties would negatively impact the programs offered to our children. <laughs> we have listened to and heard your comments and concerns, but we are not a body that can set the health policies. We have, however, shared your concerns with our elected officials and will continue to do so. Last month, with parent representatives in attendance, we met with Erie County legislators spring and shared the issues faced by the district, including at the time conflicting guidance from New York County and New York State Departments of Health. The parents and attendants at that meeting also shared their concerns with legislative brain. Last Saturday, Mr. Paul McKay, Mr. Paul House, and I attended the legislative breakfast sponsored by the New York County Association of School Boards. Mr. Paul is was one of the member moderators of that meeting which was attended by over half a dozen state assembly members and senators from New York, along with representatives from the offices of several other elected officials. At that meeting, we shared parental concerns about the possibility of mandatory vaccines. And I didn't want to speak on that tonight. In response to this concern being raised, the legislators of both political parties unanimously stated that while they support vaccinations, they would not support mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations as requirements for school attendance. Their concerns were heard and shared by legislators. 
At that meeting, our elected officials were also asked to support test to stay legislation. The legislators believed in test to stay, and several members promised to write letters to the Erie County Department of Health. This board endorses test to stay and has shared our opinion with elected officials that we will continue the advocacy efforts of efforts of both the Erie Niagara School Superintendents Association, which is located actively participates in fellow members of the Erie County Association School. Mr. Volkowski is working to schedule meetings with both Assemblyman Norris and State Senator Rapp to continue the board's advocacy efforts. The board supports a pathway forward through the pandemic and the development of a data-driven plan to eliminate COVID-19 restrictions in schools, including the reduction in masking requirements and the unnecessary quarantines for healthy children. We have and continue to encourage the parents and attendants to advocate directly with our local elected officials. They can impact state and local health policies. At the legislative breakfast, all of the elected officials stress that advocacy efforts must be frequent, focused, and direct. Mr. McCabe has prepared an advocacy packet contact information with officials who represent our district at all levels of government up to the federal government. This key points to remember when advocating, and this package is available to anyone interested. Thank you very much. Now we have a number of pink cards from the students. I'm going to ask them to join us at one time, most of them. Start with Anna Witkowski, who'd like to talk on the mask. Hi, I'm Hannah Witkowski, and I'm in the fifth grade. I play the clarinet, and I love my band instructor. However, I would like to address a masking issue. Recently, I was instructed to bring a mask home, cut a hole in it, and practice playing my instrument with it on. I don't think this is a good idea. First of all, I don't think that we should be wearing masks at all, let alone one with a hole cut in it. I don't, think, I don't need to wear one anywhere else I go, even in crowded grocery stores. Second, the air will come out of the end of my clarinet and the other holes as well, so what good is it really doing? Besides, some instruments can't be played with a mask on, so if they don't need to wear a mask, then why should I have to wear one? On a side note, teachers often have their masks down on their chin until they remember to yell at us for not having our masks pulled up. Remember, tigers shouldn't be muzzled. Thank you for allowing me to speak. students at the same time, Reagan, Landon, Hayden, Volkowski, Jeff has been thirsty, and Jeff and Ryan Owen. Gentlemen, if you just take your turn. Hello, uh, my name is Ian Volkowski. I am in 11th grade. Um, if the COVID shot is mandated uh, for all students, uh, I will be homeschooled. Uh, I will miss being on the SWIFT team. I absolutely love doing it. And um, I, I have so many wonderful teachers this year and last year, and I love seeing them. And I, I'm going to miss them, especially Mr. Cronin, Mr. McHale, and Mr. Romero. Um, I will miss playing trumpet in band. Uh, it's just such a wonderful thing, especially going to new places. And lastly, I'm going to miss going to Harkness, as I know it is my career path. And I just have a blast in that class. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lincoln Polkowski, and um, I'm in eighth grade. And if the shot gets made for all students, I will also be comfortable. Um, I'm going to miss seeing all my friends, and it's one of the best times where I'm able to see all of them because it's so often. And um, I'm going to miss being able to play in orchestra. I get to play with so many um, incredibly talented people, and I won't be able to see Mrs. Sandville, the wonderful. Um, Orchestra instructor and um, 
being able to play cello has brought so many opportunities into my life, and I don't want those to be taken away. Hi, my name is Raven Pukowski. I'm in the sixth, I'm in sixth grade. As a COVID check, it's mandated. I will be homeschooled. I want to wish to all my friends and that, that are going to get vaccinated and stay in school. I will also miss playing in the band and will not get to experience all of the band shows. Uh, hello, my name is Jack Kazerski. I'm in 11th grade. Uh, I enjoy coming to school for in person learning, uh, sports, and to see all my friends. However, if the COVID-19 shot is mandated, I will choose to be homeschooled. I will not take an experimental shot that no one knows what negative effects it will have on my body, especially when only 0.01% of people ages 5 to 17 are at risk of a fatal outcome from COVID-19. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeff Bowen. I have come to Akron since I was in kindergarten, and I am now in all grade. If the COVID-19 shot gets mandated, I will no longer I'm Thank you. Hello, I'm Ryan Owen. I'm a freshman here at Afton High School. I enjoyed uh, being at school with my friends, playing sports together and learning together. But if the COVID vaccine is mandated, I will give all that up and be homeschooled. Thank you. I'm a freshman senior here at High School. I thought they were all in a group on a group chart. I said, no, they all. They all turned in cards. See what money's taken individually. I have heard what we stay. Just bring it up, okay? And I will call you when it's your card. Andy Chamberlain and Trent Stahl are married in the next Hi, my name is Trent Stahl. I'm in 10th grade. I enjoy sports and being with my friends. I am a student with an IEP who needs my teacher's guidance and support next year. I want to attend BOCES for welding, and I will not be able to do any of that if you allow them to mandate the COVID-19 vaccine. My mom will pull me out, and I will be homeschooled. Thank you. I'm here to speak for my boys. They couldn't be here tonight. So I brought pictures so you can see what they look like. Hi, my name is Anthony, and they told me what to say. My name is Anthony Consiglio, and I'm in ninth grade. Some of the things I like about school are DDP class with Coach Klaus, playing baseball, football, and basketball with my friends, playing trombone in the marching band and parades and competitions. And if the COVID shot is mandated, I will be homeschooled and will miss all of this. Please stand up for me. It's twin brother Vincent. Hi, my name is Vincent Consiglio and I'm in ninth grade. Some of the things I like about school are random conversations with my friends at lunch, camaraderie and sports with the other athletes and with the coaches, all the wacky sock Wednesdays and flannel Fridays with Coach Klaus, along with donuts at early jazz band practice with Mr. Bardo. I was looking forward to all of the fun marching band trips including Disney, and if the COVID shot is mandated, I will be homeschooled and will miss all of these things that I love and enjoy. Please stand up for me. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Solomon, shot mandate. Hello, my name is Jennifer Salmon, and I have two kids, uh, Nicholas Salmon sitting over there, and my daughter, Alexis Salmon, seventh grade, she's currently in the softball recreation program. Both my kids from the start have been pressured that they do not want the shots if it's mandated. And they are nagging me to pull them out for homeschool schooling. And I will make that decision to walk away from my job and stay home and make sure that they're homeschooled because they do not want to come here if the vaccines are mandated. Thank you. How does 
plug myself back into that. Um, so hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Superintendent McCabe and the board um, for the efforts and your recent communications regarding the concerns raised by parents in the district. I can't follow that. I'm sorry. <sighs> Anyways, um, so thank you for addressing the concerns raised by the parents regarding masking, the vaccine mandates, and the close quarantine, uh, close contact quarantine. No doubt all those things will have an effect on our district and our students. Um, during the last board meeting, I called your attention to Assembly Bill 8378, which was introduced on October 20th, 2021 by Assemblyman Dinowich. This bill will mandate that the COVID shot for children will be a must for children to attend school. And I wanted to give you an update. Sadly, this bill has picked up two co-sponsors just last week. One of the co-sponsors is Richard Godfrey. Um, he is the chair of the Committee on Health. Now, while it's not a guarantee, it is widely understood if a committee, a chair of a committee is a co-sponsor on a bill, the bill will most likely make it out of the committee to the general floor. And if this is anything like 2019, that bill will get passed. This is no joke. So um, in your letter, um, under the next steps, supporting a pathway forward, you state, quote, the Board of Ed intends to ask elected officials to require greater collaboration between the Erie County Department of Health, school districts, and families, end quote. I couldn't agree more and appreciate that. Um, so one of the ways to achieve a collaborative effort is by sharing the feelings of your stakeholder holders or your families in this case on Bill A8378 that would mandate the COVID shot for children to attend school. This could be accomplished by conducting a one question survey of the parents within the district who have students in the districts. The question would read, if New York State mandates the COVID-19 shot for students to attend school, would you A, keep your child in the public school system, or B, homeschool your child, C, move out of state. The data collected from that survey should be shared directly with the elected officials on the New York State Assembly Committee on Health. Additionally, when you talk about collaborating with other school districts, there's an opportunity here to be leaders in our area and encourage other districts to complete a similar survey. I know Pembroke already has had that survey completed. We heard about that the last time we were here. So they should complete a similar survey and they should share that data with the New York State Assembly Committee on Health. Finally, in your letter, you're encouraging parents to share concerns with elected state representatives. And I couldn't agree more with that idea as well. Constituents absolutely must contact elected officials regarding their concerns. Regarding this assembly bill, 8378 specifically, Statewide action groups have suggested that what we, and I quote, what we do or do not do matters, and that the only way that we can win this is if tens of thousands of people take action every day, make a call, write a letter, email, go to a rally, end quote. Personally, I have to believe that we can make a difference if we act collaboratively. So I'd like to encourage all of you on this, and I'd like to encourage you to encourage your friends to do the same. Richard Godfrey's office should be the first one on the list of calls regarding his sponsorship of Bill 8378 and whether or not he could provide the evidence that supports that mandating the shot for COVID for students would result in less illness than not mandating the shot. This is not a shot that is like other childhood vaccines. This is not a childhood illness. Um, and this call should be followed up by phone calls to the standing committee members, um, the standing committee on health members. You can find the list and contact information for those elected officials on nyassembly.gov forward slash mem, M -E -M, forward slash. 
Then you select the committees and more, and you will get all the names, all the numbers of these people. It is likely that this bill will go for a vote as early as this January. And it is imperative that we form a collaborative effort and unite for the purposes of fighting to keep all of our children in school. We need to act now because the outcome of this bill passing will directly impact enrollment. And on a side note, Dawson Stone grade 10 and Everett Stone grade 11 will be homeschooled if this bill passes. So I'm just asking you and members of this district to, to take a stand and act now. Thank you. My name is Christina Weidman. I live at 44 East Avenue. I pulled this quote from the FDA document from last month. Page 11, third paragraph, it states, quote, the number of participants in the current clinical development program is too small to detect any potential risks of myocarditis associated with vaccination. Long-term safety of COVID-19 vaccine and participants five to less than two years of age will be studied in five post-authorization safety studies, including a five-year follow-up study to evaluate long-term sequel of post-vaccination myocarditis and pericarditis, unquote. Page 71, fourth paragraph states, quote, the size of the safety database is not large enough to detect any potential risks of myocarditis associated with vaccination. For this reason, long-term safety of the COVID-19 vaccine and participants five to less than 12 years of age will be studied in five post-authorization safety studies, including a five-year follow-up to study, follow-up study to evaluate long-term sequel of post-vaccination myocarditis and pericarditis, unquote. The children are the trial. They admit that long-term safety will be studied, which means it hasn't. The studies for 5 to 11 on long-term effects isn't going to drop until 2025, and the remainder of the studies to complete in 2027. We have New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio bribing children by giving them $100 to get the vaccine, going live and comically saying it buys a whole lot of candy, and now a college scholarship offered by Kathy Hopeful to get vaccinated. I cannot be the only one disgusted and horrified by this and wonder why do we need to continue to bribe people to get vaccinated, especially children who have zero control over decisions that their parents make. And don't even get me started on, this, on Sesame Street and how they're telling children that if they get vaccinated, they are protecting others as if there's some kind of walking disease. As I have said before, I am pro-vaccine for the long used routine vaccinations for children both my children are fully vaccinated. I am pro-science, but if and only if the science makes sense. Being opposed to one shot that hasn't been around for five years doesn't make me or anyone else an anti-vaxxer, even though that term is constantly thrown around at anyone who doesn't comply or questions. We are literally only one step away from a vaccine mandate, and we are very angry, frustrated, and scared, and for good reason. You see, I'm not just fighting for my nine-year-old. I'm fighting for my toddler. I, for, I'm fighting for children that will someday attend here. I'm fighting for the children of parents that are here tonight and those that cannot be here. I'm also fighting for those who are too scared to speak up and there are many. I'm fighting for all the children whose parents have signed my petitions and also for teachers and staff that have decided that the shot isn't for them. In the last 20 months, the facts have never changed. Our children who have a 99.96% recovery rate if they catch COVID are still wearing masks, even though many adults here are now vaccinated. It's clear that the burden is on our children to protect those who have now had two vaccines, a booster, and can still wear a mask at all times if they are scared of catching it. I said it once and I'll say it again. It is not my child's responsibility to keep adults safe. And I will never allow it to be or let my girls believe this lie. If nothing else comes out of this meeting tonight, I want people to understand that we truly need to question these mandates and think, is this really for the good of everyone? Or is this just another way for the state to make money? We need to push back on this vaccine mandate on behalf of our children. We are their voice. We understand that the board are not 
The board is not advocates for public health, but you are advocates for our children. If you give an inch, they take a mile. I truly believe that the mask mandate is just another distraction to keep us from fighting the real issue of vaccine mandate. Thank you. Speaker is Nathan Rakowski. First off, let me just say to all the students that are still here, because I know a bunch left, thank you for standing up for yourselves. It's awesome. Thank you yeah. to everybody. Um, to the board, I also want to thank you guys. Thanks for putting out some communication, right? Well overdue, in my opinion. I think that we should be communicating on a regular basis. I'd love to hear that communication every meeting. Right? We can take that a step further and you can update the group that comes here every time you have a board meeting. You can talk about the steps you've taken regarding the mask mandates. You can talk about steps you've taken about the test to stay. You can talk about the steps you've taken to help stop the vaccine mandate before it begins. This would be a great thing and it would go a long way with all the people here. I look out and I, I just saw Miss Turner over here. She was uh, talking about how important student enrollment is to the health of the financial health of the college, right? It was a pretty, pretty impressive slide you had there. Um, pretty important that these students still attend here for the college or the, for the, the school to remain viable. Right? So, with this vaccine mandate, you heard from a bunch of students already today saying they would not be here, they would be homeschooled. Um, I think there's a lot more. Then we're here today that are going to be homeschooled if that's the case. So we appreciate you guys working on our behalf. I know you guys were, were working with some of the legislators, and that's awesome. We truly do appreciate that. We'd like to hear more updates on what's going on. We'd love to hear an update that you started tonight's meeting with. We'd love to hear that every single week. What, what's going on? What have you done? What roadblocks have you guys hit? How can these parents out here help the board? Do these things, right? Like we're here to support you guys. If you're here to support our students, right? So that's what we're here for. So we look forward to regular updates. We look forward to hearing what the board's working on, and we even look forward to hearing your struggles and how we can help. Thank you. Much. Thank you, everyone. There was no information on the file. It said COVID mandate. There is no name or address on the file. That's my address. I'm Hello, my name is Sue Borden. I live in the Akron School District and currently have two high school children who attend Akron. At past board meetings, others spoke about and shared the results of a survey conducted by the Pembroke School District. They also requested Akron conduct a survey of their own. I have not seen a survey of our own, so I decided to translate the results of Pembroke's survey as they were Akron's results. There were four questions total. The fourth question in particular, I found the results very intriguing. Before I read the question and the results, I want to mention, according to Bill A8378, a bill that sets out to make the COVID vaccine, like our other traditional vaccines of mumps, measles, et cetera, mandatory to attend school, it is set to go up for vote this coming January. In lines nine through 13, it defines the term school and child as follows. The term school means and includes public, private, parochial child caring center, daycare nursery, daycare agency, nursery school, kindergarten, elementary, intermediate, or secondary schools. The term child shall mean and include any person between the ages of two months and 18 years. Just let that sink in for a minute. Two months old. 
I wonder when those mandates will become reality. Back to the question, which is, if New York State passes Bill A8378, which will mandate the COVID-19 vaccine in order for children to attend school without any other option, would you, one, send them to school no matter what, remove your child and homeschool, or are you unsure? The results were 30% were not sure, 29 would send their kids no matter what, 41% would choose to homeschool. Let's take a closer look at the 41% of students that will be pulled out and start homeschooling. When I took that 41% from Pembroke survey and calculated it to fit Akron's current enrollment, I got some pretty interesting numbers. According to a website, publicschoolreview.com, we currently have approximately 1,360 students enrolled in Akron. 41% of 1,360 equals 557 students. On the same website, I also found the school currently gets approximately $23,600 per student per year. Now let's do a bit of math. Let's take the 557 unregistered students and multiply that number by $23,600 the school receives per student per year. Any guesses? It's over $13 million. How many employees of Akron Central School District does $13 million represent? How many will be kitchen staff? How many will be custodians and grounds crew? How many bus drivers? How many teachers? How many tough conversations will you have? How are you going to look these students, your colleagues and friends in the eye and tell them they no longer are able to come to school here or have a job at Akron? Mr. Bickhave, you have said it many times, you want nothing more than to keep these kids in school. Here's some hard factual numbers for you. As of 5 p.m. today, you are looking at at least 61 families representing 130 students, which is more than one entire graduating class at Akron that will not be in school if this bill passes. If I can take the liberty to speak for the 61 families and the 130 kids on this list, I don't think they want to leave their school. But this blow dart to the arm has risks attached to it. These are 61 families that are not willing to take that risk. To anyone here or watching us via technology, sees yourself as part of the 41% considering homeschooling, but have no idea where to start, please go to the Facebook page, Akron Students First, where you will find a previously recorded Facebook Live homeschooling info session. The board members, Ms. McCabe, the, the, the community needs your help. We need you to communicate more, to be more transparent. We need each other. That's why last meeting, I suggested you hold a town meeting, a place where we can all come together and have a two-way conversation. Not this, we read speeches, we prepare, you listen for a few minutes, and then weeks or months later, you respond via email. We cannot continue down this path. We are running out of time. This bill goes up for a vote in less than two months. We need to choose the path that allows us to work stronger, together. Finally, there was a great and wise man who once walked this earth and was quoted as saying, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. That is how it is recorded in the books of Matthew and Mark, or more simply said in the book, or Matthew and Luke, Luke. or more simply said in the book of Mark, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Thank you for your time. I want to thank uh, Mr. McKay, Superintendent Seymour, for good evening, everyone. Uh, start by I'll be addressing the COVID 19 information later in my report for. But I just want to thank our students for the kind words that you said uh, regarding your experience here at Akron. Teachers, I'm sure, would love to hear those firsthand, but it does, despite the challenges we all face, it is rewarding to hear how strongly our kids feel about their education. 
So kind of picking up where this evening uh, started, so you have to take the board into the community on the capital project. On Monday, October 8th, district representatives met with representatives from CPL architecture and project managers from campus construction. The team spent time reviewing uh, areas of the campus that were identified back in 2018 as in need of address, to be addressed through a capital project. But they at that time were set off this morning. Earlier, prior to the start of the meeting for the community that's here, the board had an opportunity to look at some of those things we intended to do on campus tour, but given shade of night and chilly temperatures, we did a, essentially a virtual tour. We will um, in November, I'm sorry, yeah, the 29th of this month, following stakeholders for further discussion of needs that we're having here on campus, whether it's within the building or with our athletic field. So the stakeholders can be identified, and those stakeholders will have the responsibility of communicating um, with members of the public, staff, and administration. Um, we have continued to do our facilities review, and that, that process will occur again on the 29th. I will continue to update the board as we move forward. And I want to again thank Mrs. Sutter for her work in managing those needs. On a somewhat related note, campus construction has offered the district a pre referendum agreement, an agreement to start the process for a future. Capital project. Um, we have not entered into that. There's no fee for that pre referendum agreement, but it does serve as uh, essentially our commitment to work with campus on the next project if someone decides to do that. So at this time, we haven't entered into any pre referendum agreement, um, given that the board is just hearing the information about a potential project. At some point, Recently, I want to switch to an internal audit. Recently, the board received a communication by email from uh, Ryan Dunning from Allied Financial Partners. Uh, they were formerly a lot of Fox. Uh, they had a contract with the board to do our internal audits. Each year, they look at our books, if you will, and our internal controls and our processes. Processes are critical to district operations. Some of the things that they will examine are our purchasing, our hiring, termination, enhanced reporting, capital project manager payroll, benefits, and information technology. After performing our risk assessment, already they've determined they will most likely look at the area of capital project management and human resources. The intention of email that you received was to inquire as to whether or not the board would like is comfortable with the capital project uh, management and human resources, or there's other areas of internal auditing the board would like to see the discretion. But for our one, I can just report that on the chat. Or if there is something you want to do, I have time. Okay, I'll just go ahead and Respond to that email. I know this is better than the regular communication. We were just my ally trying to part of the bill. We're comfortable with the recommendations for the audit. So I have a bit of good news, but I'm going to caution with it. Um, stay cautious. It's a report that our number of positive COVID 19 cases is remaining. Fairly consistent from week to week. I updated the board two weeks ago, and I just want to share that information again. Our total positive cases for both students and staff over the last six weeks is elementary, middle, high, students and staff combined. This is six weeks of numbers seven positive, three, four, seven, six, so far, five. All of those are single digits. Certainly reassuring to me. Same time, I need to make you aware that, as you know, the COVID situation is requiring, has resulted in a great deal of communication and collaboration in districts and 
question mark. Hearing from my colleagues constantly. We are seeing spikes in certain areas within our geographic range. District are reporting. Obviously, some of them are much larger districts, but significant numbers, similar to what we saw in September when we were reporting 25 and 27 a week. That's what we're starting to see emerge in some of the surrounding areas that are adjacent to us. I'm just I say that as a word of caution for all of us, for our for our safety. We do want to obviously continue to school. And so we're anticipating, I always have to hear the words, anticipating that could happen. We're talking to our owners about just making sure that our facilities remain remain in the pristine condition they are. Our maintenance staff is fantastic about our cleaning. Transportation is wonderful about taking those buses, but still, I think we have to see the potential at all times. Um, I'm sure you're aware about the seven day road average in Western New York. It is currently 8.5%, which is double the number statewide. And you're hearing about it in Finger Lakes, uh, districts in our area that have winter road conditions and more bus drivers. So I hate to sound like a wet blanket, but just need to advise the board that we have to be prepared for all contingencies. That's why we do have the remote learning model. That's a worst case scenario. So it's important that we have that model. We're looking at our, our ability to access technology should that become more clear. Um, we've heard the CV members of the community speak regarding. Hesitation, severe hesitations, reluctance to the vaccination for their children. We respect that. Um, with regard to the survey that I sent out on behalf of the Erie County Department of Health that all districts in the Erie County sent out, uh, I wanted to share those numbers publicly. The survey was fairly simple. It said, Would you be willing to give yes or no? Uh, are you interested in having your child? Five to eleven receive a vaccination, and you had identified the district you were from. I contacted the Department of Health, they shared the data with me. We have approximately 459 households in that range of five to 11 year olds. That represents 658 children. 530 people responded to the survey, so it's Noteworthy that we had more people respond than we have families. That's the issue with surveys. Sometimes we can do them multiple times, but we think they're supposed to be given to each child. We have that with our own surveys that we use in here and with our technology surveys. Yeah, sorry. But nonetheless, the data was simply this 121 responses said yes, that's 23%. 409 responses said no, approximately 77%. As I kind of predicted at our last board meeting, those numbers are virtually the same as our current vaccination rate for youth, grade seven to 12. Uh, those numbers have picked up slightly. Uh, I think we're around 28 percent. Our highest uh, numbers of vaccinations are at the secondary level, particularly in grades 12 and 11. Uh, I don't have those numbers in front of me. I share this with with the board this evening and the community this evening for a couple of reasons. Mr. Fran mentioned, the board mentioned in their letter to the community about our work with the legislators and making the legislators aware of the sentiment uh, within our community. The people that have spoken to the board uh, publicly in our meetings with the data tells the story as well. And those numbers have been shared with the legislators, and certainly the area kind of department of health. Regrettably, I don't have any information from other districts that wasn't shared with me. I will ask my colleagues if they have the data because I would like to compile that and have a neutral perspective. My understanding is that not every superintendent asks for those, so not now they have. In regard to test to stay, um, you recall this is a bit of an update. I had mentioned at our last meeting there was an October 27th Department of Health memo to the local Department of Health that uh, uh, shared with superintendents. That memo simply stated that the New York State Department of Health was putting it on the local Department of Health to determine whether.
whether or not they would choose to do a stay, but they would not support it or would they endorse it. It was a matter of the local health department health decision. Fast forward two weeks, a lot has transpired. We've had the Erie Niagara School Superintendents Association endorsing the test stay approach. We've had the New York State Council of School Superintendents endorsing the test to stay approach. You've had the Erie County Associated School Boards becoming more aware, seemingly, at least anecdotally, in support of an approach that would keep kids in school. I want to make sure that the most clear on what test to stay actually means. In general, it's really up to local department of health to spell out the details. So generally what it means is that if an individual, say a student, is in close contact with a positive case, and ordinarily they would be placed in quarantine, the state model would allow that child or that group of children to stay in school, provided that they were asymptomatic and received a daily negative test result for seven days from the story. So they had to occur at home. Important to know the test to stay model, at least as described by the New York State Department of Health, is only for academic purposes. In other words, if this, according to the New York State Department of Health, that model were to be permissible, a child would still be placed in not allowed to participate in extracurricular activities, only for the school itself. Um, quite frankly, Biggest challenge that I see, and many others see with the test to stay model, not that it's not a good idea, not something that we would certainly uh, endorse, we would. The greatest challenge is the availability of the test. Right now, if you go to your local department store or CVS or what have you, my understanding, I've never bought them, but they come in a two pack, the whole test, they're exceedingly expensive. Yeah, and it can be hard to get. When I requested tests from the state, they sent me a box of 48. That's it. 48 single use tests. So let's imagine that we had 10 children that were identified as close contact. Those 10 children would be 70 tests. But right now, our numbers are, are low. And because of what we've done with social distancing, um, our number of close contacts are dramatically increased. The challenge right now is the availability of the test. My understanding is the County Department of Health is now, because of a lot of the pressure, if you will, starting to look at the test system model. I don't have any update on what that might look like. I'm sure they're looking at the logistics. I get the tests, uh, who would administer them, and so on. A final thing I have to share with the board and the community so that you understand in order to administer tests, an entity like the school district needs to have a license to do so, called a limited service laboratory license. And you need your medical director to approve it. Last year, with we had to do a few years ago. We had to do the 20% random sampling. Our medical director would not allow us to use their license. The liability for them, the legal liability that they weren't willing to entertain, it was not part of our contract. So we had to contract with an outside <coughs> group to use their license. We only had to test one time. The one thing, one of the logistical things would be the ability to get a limited service lab. You also need something that's called a CLIA number, that's your approval of order test through the state. So a district of our size, those things are, are challenging, but all likely the test the state model would put, be put in place, we would need to contract with the third party vendor to come into school. We would have to have an LSL, and they would have to have a certified medical this is something we're watching closely. We're advocating for, uh, for uh, obviously, the community. Um, 
would I have information? I want to put something out there that that is great now. It's going to be very much, very much in development. Which I'm going to get to that. Yes. Given the fact that when you go to the play, you're basically your own play. How we know how extensive training might be for someone here within the district to actually administer. So I, I, sh I share that with you because the question brings up an excellent point. There could be a provision that you supply the test to the family and you just have to provide, because if it's seven days, they may have to do it on a weekend. And it would be up to the family to do that. Very similar to what we currently do when we ask families like symptomatic, just keep the child home, but we, we have to. Put the trust in the family that they're going to do the responsible thing. And obviously, if the test comes up positive, our families have been great about informing our family, keeping their child uh, uh, cared for and making sure that no other child gets sick. Um, that's the big thing is who would administer? If they're administered, administered on campus, we can do all of that. If we're allowed to just simply send them home, um, we have to come up with secure ways. Do so, prepare, pick them up. That would be that would be fine too. So I'm waiting, uh, waiting to hear what the Department of Health is doing. But again, it's important to note here the Department, the New York State Department of Health, that they would not support or enforce it. So uh, they're going to give us the tests. We have to purchase them. There's a lot, but we're hearing these things from the other hand. It's not an overnight. The last thing I have for the board this evening is just in your packet is the proposed budget calendar for this year. Budget calendar is created in the effort to provide the buildings, the departments, the leaders. It's a really a systematic method of resolving the United States budget, and it also allows the director of the to support the agency. As you have probably passed, it was with the nation report uh, about the process. Some of the items on the budget calendar will go are highlighted in red. That's because those dates are competitive, and we do adjust the calendar. It generally is the most uh, So, any questions about the calendar? No, but I do appreciate the detail and the fact that presentation on the steps that are going to take place to enact that budget. Actions of the Akron Central School Board of Education accept the minutes of the October 20th and November 3rd, 2021 regular business meetings as submitted by District Clerk Roxanne Rabbit, sent by the 5A and 5B. We'll do this discourse now. Secondly, Mr. Kenlon, questions or comments? Item six is the instructional appointment. This is an individual motion. Our recommendations in the Akron Central School Board of Education upon the recommendation of Kathy PDK, Superintendent of Schools, is hereby approved the appointment of Susan Brown to a full time regular probationary position as a teacher assistant in the 10 year area of teacher assistant. This probationary service shall begin on November 18th, 2021. And end on November 17, 2025, unless extended in accordance with the law. This expiration date is tentative and conditional only. The 10 year date can be November 18, 2025, subject to satisfactory performance. The appointee holds a teaching assistant level one certificate. The salary for the school year 2021 2022 will be in accordance with the district AFA collective bargaining agreement prorated at 62% of schedule one staff one. Move, Mrs. K. Second, Mr. Kellogg. Questions or comments? Thank you. 
Thank you. Item seven, personnel instructional uh, recommended actions that we approve the legal maps request from elementary teacher Sarah Martino, effective on or about February 14, 2022, through March 28, 2022, until cleared by her petition to return to work. Approved, Mr. Kopaski. Second, Ms. Forrestal. Questions or comments? Item eight, personal non instruction. Our recommended actions of the Akron Central School Board of Education upon the recommendation of Dr. Katie Kane, Superintendent of Schools, is hereby approved non instructional items consent 8A to 8E. Move Mrs. K. Second. Second, Mr. Kenla. Questions or comments? Item nine, uh, district items are recommended actions to the Akron Central School Board of Education upon the recommendation of Patrick B. Kane, Superintendent of Schools, is hereby approved district items consent 9A to 9D. Move. Move, Mr. Kenlock. Second, this for staff questions or comments. Item 10, special education. Our recommended actions at the Edward Central School Board of Education upon the recommendation of Patrick B. Kane, Superintendent of Schools, is hereby approved special education items in Senate 10A and 10B. Move, Mrs. K. A. Second, Mrs. Forcial. Questions or comments? Item 11, financial reports. Our recommended action is that the Akron Central School Board of Education approve the financial reports for October 2021 as submitted by District Treasurer Susan Brewer. Moved. Moved, Mr. Kenline. Second, Mr. Kalkowski. Uh, Mrs. Treader is here this evening. Uh, if there are any questions for Mrs. Treader. Would you please? Uh, share with Mrs. Brewer, we do appreciate your detail and reports. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Item 12, school board correspondence. Thursday, November 18th is the DCAS meet legislative team meeting virtually at 6 30 a.m. Yes, uh, they are meeting virtually primarily because uh, we are going to set up a new bill track fit. Something that DCASD um, signed on to is actually what BookTrack uh, does. It allows you to uh, navigate the information that's out there, information of the uh, assembly and Senate bills, uh, both in your local legislature, uh, state, and also federally. Um, we are at, uh, your representatives at all levels to see what they are in the process of doing. Uh, the purpose of this is to identify such as uh, a 8378 plan to see what the current status of the bill is in, uh, those that have signed on, and also the purchase of associated plans. Uh, so that will be instructed to those every member of the CSB uh, when the legislative team uh, will have the opportunity to sign on to that to do their own research uh, and have an opportunity. Thursday, December 2nd, DCS, DC ASB speed boarding presentation and hearing what both receive from 6.30 to 8.30. Please see Mrs. Redmond. 
by November 22nd for registration. Upcoming dates, Thursday, November 23rd, we are teaching conferences from 4.30 to 7.30 in the evening. Wednesday, November 24th, we are teaching conferences from 8 to 11.30 in the morning. Thursday and Friday, November 25th and 6th, no school, next week recess. And Wednesday, December 1st is our next board meeting here in the cafeteria at 7 o'clock. Item 14, board discussion, any items uh, of the board that we haven't discussed? I'd just like to share that on Monday, uh, the board did conduct a retreat. Uh, my office met with representatives of John and Martha leadership, a tour of the organization, and shared a meal on the foundation of the banks. And it's all part of the effort that the school is undergoing. Item 15, executive session. We do have a need to go into a session, executive session, tonight to discuss negotiations. Move, Mr. Kenline. Second, Mrs. K.A. Any questions or comments on that? We are in executive session 839. We do not attend any business after we come out of executive session. Thank you everyone for attending and sharing your concerns this evening.